Welcome to the Chalkboard, my fellow football nerds, for episode number 68 of Chalk Talk, brought to you by The Painted Lines. I'm your host, Half or Shane Half, and you can follow me on Twitter at half and half underscore TPL. And I am excited tonight to finally be back because football season is finally here. We spent so much time talking about draft and talking about you know, over-unders and all these other things that you could talk about, but it is finally time to actually break down NFL action. And I couldn't be more excited about it. So if you are watching live here on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, be sure you drop a comment. I would love to field your questions about these games, about these matchups. Um, would love to be able to interact with you guys as we go. If you are watching this back later, drop us a comment anyways on YouTube. Uh, specifically, if you're on the Painted Lines YouTube, I'll, I'll hopefully see that and be able to get back to you. My DMs are always open if you want to be able to reach out to me. Uh, I appreciate any of the interaction that I can get with you guys. So we've already got a comment coming in here. We've got Steve on YouTube says, good evening. Do you think the Eagles will win this year? I definitely think the Eagles are going to win some games this year. Uh, I've got the Eagles somewhere around like an 11, 11-ish win team. So I'm really excited to see the product on the field. So without any further ado, let's jump into it. So as we always do on Chalk Talk, we're going to lead off with the Philadelphia Eagles game. Then we'll bounce out into the NFL as a whole. So if you're not an Eagles fan, don't fret. We're going to cover every game, give you breakdowns, give you some uh, maybe some gambling picks, some game picks, things like that. Uh, It should be fun. So let's get into it. So first of all, let's talk about Philadelphia Eagles and their season opener on the road against the Detroit Lions. I don't know if you watched Hard Knocks, but the Lions featured on Hard Knocks. I'm not a big Hard Knocks guy. I'm not a big Dan Campbell guy. I think Dan Campbell gives good speeches. We'll see where he's at as a coach. Um, So we'll see what he's able to do with this team. There's some talent on this team for Detroit. I don't think it's the most talented team. Obviously, I think they're – in the running for being a top pick this year. But week one, honestly, I would rather face a good team week one. In college, you want to play that cupcake team week one to sort of open up your schedule. But in the NFL, these are all NFL athletes. And so uh, I would rather play a good team that's maybe a little rusty than a bad team that probably played their starters all throughout the preseason while you're a little rusty and just a bad mix. And so week one games are weird. There's always weird things that happen in week one. So let's get into it here. I think one of the biggest things to watch in this game is Jonathan Gannon for the Eagles. What is he going to do against Jared Goff? There were a lot of excuses made for Jonathan Gannon last year, and a lot of them were valid. There weren't, there was not a lot of talent on this defense. And so the Eagles played this drop seven into coverage, rush four, soft defense, and allowed Derek Carr to complete 90% of his passes, allowed Justin Herbert to complete 90% of his passes. And you could say they didn't have the personnel and you're certainly right about that. Now I don't like that argument because a coach could should adapt his scheme to his personnel, but I digress on that point. But if you think about the Eagles defense, what were their weaknesses last year? Well, they didn't have an edge rusher that could get to the passer consistently. They went out and they signed Hassan Reddick in free agency, had double digit sacks the last couple of years. They had trouble stopping the run. And so they go out, they trade up, they draft Jordan Davis, probably a premier run stuffer. They didn't have linebackers that could cover anybody. Well, they draft N'Kobe Dean in the third round. They signed Kazir White. They didn't have a good CB2. They go and they get James Bradbury. They don't have good safeties. They traded for Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, who is more of a slot corner. He plays a little bit of everywhere, but he's going to play safety for them. And so every weakness that this defense had was addressed except for Jonathan Gannon. And I'm concerned about Gannon. I really am. I, I don't know how Gannon is going to do this year. This is a prove it year for Gannon. Gannon will not be the defensive coordinator for the Eagles next year. He got some head coaching interviews this last off season, which was insane to me, but he's either going to get hired as a head coach because the Eagles defense is on fire this year, or he's going to get fired because it doesn't work out. I don't know which it'll be, but I do know that Jared Goff struggles mightily against pressure. If you can keep Jared Goff's jersey clean, he's a passable, you know, maybe even a, a, an average to slightly above average NFL quarterback, but he more than anybody else in the league totally crumples under pressure. And so I'm going to know the first drive 
if Jonathan Gannon has changed based on if the Eagles bring pressure. This is not a game that you just sit back and rush for. At least give me some sim pressures. Give me some blitz packages. You need to make Jared Goff uncomfortable. Don't just play this soft rush four, drop seven. Let Jared Goff take his check downs. Jared Goff wants to take his check downs. He's not an aggressive quarterback. Make him be aggressive. Make him make quick reads. Get the ball out of his hand because pressure is coming and see if you can get him to fold. Steve says, I'm following you on Twitter. Appreciate that. Uh, if you guys are watching here, you can give me a follow on Twitter at half and half underscore TPL. I do tweet a lot about the Eagles. I tweet live game clips during the game, and I'll certainly be doing that on Sunday. So for, you know, the, the, the part of the ball that is the part of the game that is the Eagles defense against the Lions offense, the Eagles have a marked personnel advantage. I'm excited to see uh, Panay Suell and Taylor Decker, their offensive tackles, match up against uh, Hassan Reddick. I want to see what Hassan Reddick has, his chops as a pass rusher. And to be honest, I really want to see how Jonathan Gannon uses him. I don't want to see him dropping into coverage a whole lot. Uh, I want to see also how, how Chauncey Gardner-Johnson is used. I think that you're going to see Chauncey Gardner-Johnson lined up in man coverage a lot on TJ Hawkinson, maybe against DJ Shark. Uh, those guys in the slot, maybe Amon Ross St. Brown when they put him in the slot. I just, he, he's kind of transitioning to a new position. I don't think the Eagles are just going to like throw him out there and say, you know, play half field safety stuff all game. I think they're going to put him in man and kind of slowly work him into that. So I think you could see a lot of quarters or quarter, quarter, half defense, which, you know, maybe I'll put a video out on that. I've got an article about it on the painted lines. If you go there and you search football 101, I have an article about cover four that kind of breaks down what some of those reads are, but I think you can see a lot of that from the Eagles defense. I also want to see Jordan Davis. I mean, he looked really good in that first preseason game. Uh, granted, you can't take a lot from a preseason game, but he looked good. And all of a sudden the Lions interior offensive line looks like a wreck. Halapulavati Vitae just got put on IR and they're, they're thin there. It should be a place that the Eagles can exploit. The one concern I have besides uh, the aforementioned issues with Jonathan Gannon, though, is DJ Shark. He's 6'4", ran a 4'3", 40, so he's an athletic freak. He's tall. He's fast. Those are the exact types of cornerbacks that have given Darius Slay problems in the past. If you remember what DK Metcalf did to him a couple of years ago. Now, Shark has not had a great career. He's no DK Metcalf, but... Most of his issues have come from being in Jacksonville and also being injured. And so not that Detroit is a better landing spot, but I, I, I'm a little concerned about that matchup. I wonder if you'll see James Bradbury on him. So I'm really interested to see some of the some of the checks that they'll do, some of the schematic things that the Eagles defense is going to try to do against the Lions offense. Uh, Steve says, I'm not a Cowboy fan, but I'll ask you how – how do you think they'll do? Well, I get to my game preview of them later, but I do expect on the year, I expect them to regress. I'm not a big Mike McCarthy guy. The Tyron Smith injury really hurts uh, the Cowboys. They lose um, Amari Cooper for almost nothing. They lose Cedric Wilson. They have uh, Garrett, not Garrett Wilson, Michael Gallup, excuse me, coming back off of an injury. So, I think their offense could struggle a little bit as, as they start. I think Trevon Diggs, you know, the Cowboys defense last year lived and died on turnovers. I think you're going to see some regression to the mean there. So it could still be a talented defense. I just think it's going to be a, a step back uh, for the Cowboys. So the stage is set for the Eagles to take a leap forward here. Got another comment says it's going to be hard to judge Gannon because the talent might make him look good. That's true. But you'll be able to tell schematically some of the things that he's doing as well. And, you know, if not against the Lions, the Eagles will play Kirk Cousins in week two. And Kirk Cousins has long sort of been that litmus test for quarterbacks. Like, if you're better than Kirk Cousins, you're good. And if you're not, you're not. And if you're Kirk Cousins, I don't know what you are. But we'll see Kirk Cousins against Justin, you know, Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson against this defense in week two on Monday Night Football. So we'll get a good picture then. But schematically, there's just some things I want to see. And then for the Eagles offensively, uh, it, the running game is a little concerning. Miles Sanders is still questionable. Neither Boston Scott or Kenny Gainwell has proved they're a feature back. Now, the Trey Sermon pickup I really like. I think if they dress him on Sunday, it's going to tell you a lot about where Miles Sanders is at. But right now, we don't know. 
We should have the offensive line healthy. I believe Jason Kelsey is expected to play for week one. So uh, there's been no update, but he's returned to practice. So that looks good. Miles Sanders still out of practice. But I look at the Eagles passing attack. And the only person that can stop that passing attack is Jalen Hurts. I mean, the Lions don't have a very good secondary. They have Jeffrey Okuda, who I'm excited to see. He was a top five pick a few years ago, had a horrendous rookie season. And then he tried to come off of that rookie season to improve last year. And he got hurt season ending injury week one. So that was a terrible break for him. But we really haven't seen the guy play in almost two years since he finished his rookie season. So Akuda certainly has talent. He went very high in the draft. I'm excited to see him lock horns with Devonta Smith, with A.J. Brown, whoever it is. But the Lions linebacking core is just really bad. I think this should be a big Dallas Goddard game. I think Dallas Goddard, if you were going to say you have to pick someone to have a 100-yard game, who would it be? I would say it's Dallas Goddard. Um, Hertz certainly has chemistry with him. He's great on those outbreaking sail flood concepts they like to run against zone coverage, which you're going to see a lot of zone against the Eagles uh, from Detroit just by virtue of keeping eyes on Jalen Hurts. Against those zones, you can work those, those concepts towards the sideline that Dallas Goddard is so good at. So I would expect to see a lot of three-by-one formations with – A.J. Brown on the backside running digs and slants over the middle of the field to keep the defense honest with a lot of targets going to Ertz uh, near the sideline. So I think on talent, the Eagles should win this game. If this game was in week four or week eight, I, I would pick the Eagles to win in a landslide. As it is, week one games make me nervous, especially you know for the Eagles, a team that they played their starters like one – series the first preseason game and then they didn't play him again which I think is the right move but when you talk about where a team is going to be at heading into week one uh, are they going to be sharp are they going to come out I, I think this could be a game where at halftime you're sitting there in a 10 to 7 game thinking what is going on maybe you're losing that game and then they really pull it out in the second half so I'm taking the Eagles to win this game this game should look easy because it is week one maybe it won't uh but I'm going to have the birds winning this game. Go Eagles. So let's move on to the rest of the games here. And let's talk about the Thursday night kickoff game. Uh, the Buffalo Bills traveling to Los Angeles to take on the Rams. This is the battle of the Shans. You got Sean McDermott in Buffalo versus Sean McVay in Los Angeles. The Bills are the favorites in Vegas to win the Super Bowl this year but they travel to the team that won it a year ago. So you got to love the storyline. The schedule makers really know what they're doing. The last time we saw the Bills, they were walking off the field after losing in overtime to the Chiefs when Josh Allen didn't get a chance to hold the ball. It led to overtime rule changes. And so the Bills are going to be back on a revenge tour. The Rams, they've lost a lot of pieces. They no longer have Odell Beckham Jr. They did add Allen Robinson, who – was really bad last year in Chicago, but everything was bad last year in Chicago. So we'll see how he works, if he can sort of revive his career. But the offense is going to have to function differently without Robert Woods and OBJ. Those guys were so integral to this offense. Robert Woods was such a good run blocker. He allowed them to do some things. It was almost like running an extra tight end on the field uh, in those situations. And OBJ just opened up so much over the middle of the field. He opened up a lot of things for Cooper Cup. The other big question mark is, is Matthew Stafford's elbow okay? You had the reports come out about his elbow, about it causing problems. Uh, that That's a big concern for the Rams. And so we need to see the Rams, see how Stafford looks, see how that offense looks. And on the defense, they the Rams have taken this defensive stars and scrubs approach about as far as you can. Like, can you name a player on the Rams defense other than Jalen Ramsey, Aaron Donald, or Bobby Wagner? They have an elite player at each of the three uh, line or each of the three levels of the secondary. They arguably have the two best defensive players in football in Jalen Ramsey and Aaron Donald. And yet I'm a little concerned about the defense. Uh, I'm concerned about how it's all going to work together. They lost Von Miller. In fact, they lost him to the Bills. So the Bills stole Von Miller. You look at the Bills. Josh Josh Allen was good last season, but he flipped a switch down the stretch. 
uh, when he got more involved with his legs. So Brian Dable is gone. How is that going to affect this offense? How is that going to affect Josh Allen? Now, I'm of the opinion that Josh Allen is an elite quarterback, and so it's not going to have a big impact. But you never know. You know, was Josh Allen good because of Brian Dable? Was Brian Dable good because of Josh Allen? We're going to find that out this year. But the Bills only got better this offseason. They added Jamison Crowder. They added Kair Elam. They added James Cook in the draft. They stole Von Miller from the Rams. But they're still down Tredavious White, who starts the year on the pup list. And so this is going to be a big test for Kair Elam as he's going to have to cover Cooper Cup. That's going to be a big assignment for the rookie against the Triple Crown winner last year in receiving. I think the Bills win this game. But it should be a great Thursday night football game, a great kickoff game. I'm picking the Bills. Uh, they're going to start off 1-0. and The defending champs start off 0-1. Let's roll on now to the Sunday slate. In the Sunday 1 o'clock slot, we have a game of big interest to Eagles fans. It's the New Orleans Saints traveling to the Atlanta Falcons. And, of course, it's so... Uh, big for Eagles fans because they hold the Saints uh, first round pick in this upcoming draft. The Saints have a new head coach in Dennis Allen, who's a defensive minded coach. They have Jameis Winston back under center, leading what's going to feel like an entirely new offense with Michael Thomas back from injury. And then the additions of Chris Olave in the draft and Jarvis Landry through free agency. Now their left tackle Trevor Penning is out. He got injured but it's still going to feel so much better offensively than what they were working with last season. The Falcons don't have Matt Ryan anymore after they traded him to Indianapolis. Instead, they have Marcus Mariota under center, backed up by the rookie Desmond Ritter, and it'll be interesting to monitor that, see how long the leash is for uh, Marcus Mariota this season. And then they have a duo of huge pass-catching threats in Kyle Pitts, who had a Incredible season last year at tight end. And then Drake London, who is almost just another massive tight end that plays wide receiver. How are they going to utilize those guys? You know, if all else fails, you can throw up jump balls to those guys, and you could probably feel pretty good about the outcomes there. With all that said, as much as there is intriguing about watching the Falcons, I'm intrigued by Desmond Ritter and Kyle Pitts and Drake London, but the roster is still bad. Yeah, they've got A.J. Terrell on defense, but that's about it. And while I'm higher on the Falcons than most people are, and I'm lower on the Saints than most people are nationally, I saw today somebody had them predicted to win the NFC, like the one seed, and I just don't see that. I can't go this far. I think the Saints defense, even without Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, even potentially without Marcus May, I think it's enough to get them through this one in a low-scoring affair. So I'm going to pick the Saints. This is the first one that I have money on, though. I took the under on the total point line. The total points was set at 42 and a half. I took the under. I think this is going to be a low scoring slot fest, if you will. And so I took under 42 and a half, if you want to write that down uh, and check that out later. So let's move on to another spicy game here. Cleveland traveling to Carolina, the Baker Mayfield revenge game. Baker Mayfield gets to welcome uh, the team that did not want him into his new team's facility in week one. you got to love the schedule makers in the NFL and how they do this. And so the Cleveland Browns will be starting Jacoby Brissett. Of course, Deshaun Watson suspended the first 11 games of the year. Uh, Brissett started five games last year in Miami, and he went two and three. He, he's a low-level starting quarterback. He's not a guy that you want starting. He's an okay backup. But they still have Nick Chubb. They have Kareem Hunt. They're going to rely heavily on the running game in this one. Amari Cooper was a huge upgrade for them, a steal, really. They just got a, they gave up a fifth-round pick for him in what was essentially a salary dump for the Cowboys. So they've got Amari Cooper. They've got a good rushing attack. They've got the makings of a really good defense. It's just all going to come down to can Jacoby Brissett manage the game. Um, you know, looking at it for Carolina, it could be a long game for Baker Mayfield. Rookie left tackle Akeem Aquanu is going to be thrown into the fire against Miles Garrett. That is not the guy that you want to face. Probably the second best pass rusher in the NFL behind TJ Watt, in my opinion, is your week one opponent. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, recent acquisition, LaVisca Chenault Jr. may not figure into the game prominently, 
but I would look for a package of plays designed to get the ball into his hands in space. That's one of his strengths is just having the ball making plays in space. Uh, I think Carolina does enough. I think Jacoby Brissett makes just enough mistakes. I'm going to take Carolina in this one. Uh, I don't feel confident enough to bet the spread on this one, but I'm going to pick Carolina to win at home. Moving on to our next one, we have the San Francisco 49ers at the Chicago Bears. This is the battle of the 2021 QB class. Justin Fields versus Trey Lance. Trey Lance went number three overall to San Francisco. Uh, Justin Fields went I 10th or 11th to the Bears. I can't remember exactly what his draft slot was. Last year, Justin Fields, when he faced this 49ers defense, this vaunted defense, he completed 70% of his passes and he rushed for 100 yards. But he also took four sacks and he lost a pick. So that was kind of the roller coaster of Justin Fields last year. This year's the Bears have a new head coach and it's a head coach with a defensive background in Matt Everflus. So they had they got rid of Matt Nagy, they got rid of Ryan Pace, and they brought in a defensive guy, and they made several moves to bolster the defense. Uh, Jaquan Brisker, Kyler Gordon, uh, both guys that were highly rated for me in the draft, but because they like draft capital, the offense fell on the back burner. And so the question is, did they do enough? They tried to address the offensive line late in the draft and in free agency. Can they keep Justin Fields upright against Bosa and the 49ers defense? On the 49ers side, what is Trey Lance? Trey Lance was a raw FCS prospect who has now thrown 101 passes in the last 33 months. That's not ideal. I don't know what the 49ers have in Trey Lance. Uh, I think he's one of the biggest X factors in this season. If he is, if he can be like a Jimmy G level of competency early in the year and develop as the season goes, the 49ers are probably the favorite to win the NFC, but I just can't put that on a rookie here, or well, he's not a rookie, but essentially a rookie. He didn't hardly play last year. And then on top of that, the 49ers retain Jimmy G. He's sitting on the bench. And so the pressure is on Trey Lance to settle in quickly. Kyle Shanahan does a terrible job with his young players and Jimmy G is well-liked in the locker room. I'm not saying there's going to be a quick trigger, but there could be internal pressure from guys in the locker room. If Trey Lance starts Poorly, especially if, you know, he's the reason they lose a game or two earlier in the year. The 49ers have a superior roster in every possible way in this game. I'm going to look for them to grind it out in a low scoring affair. So I'll take the 49ers here. This is the second game that I've got money on. I have the point total under 41 and a half for Chicago, San Francisco. So another one of those that I think will be a low scoring game in week one. Moving on to the AFC North, we have the Pittsburgh Steelers traveling to Cincinnati to take on the Bengals, longtime division rivals in the AFC North, and they're matching up for a season opener for the first time ever in 2022. Of course, the Bengals coming off of an incredible postseason run that fall, saw them fall just short in the Super Bowl. And the Steelers are coming into the season with a lot of unknowns, particularly at quarterback, where we don't know who the starter will be. Uh, it's believed to be Mitchell Trubisky, especially since he was named captain. The Steelers did release a depth chart. Uh, actually, yeah, they, they have released a depth chart. So Trubisky is QB1. He is starting. Kenny Pickett is going to be quarterback, too. George Pickens has looked great in camp. If there's one thing that they've been able to do consistently, it is draft and develop receivers. And so on the flip side for the Bengals, the two biggest issues last year for the Bengals were offensive line play and quarter, corner back play. They addressed offensive line heavily, but cornerback was largely neglected, and I have a feeling that could come back to bite them this year. The Steelers also had huge issues on the offensive line and at quarterback a year ago. They haven't really done much to address the offensive line. They have made moves at quarterback with, like I said, Mitch Trubisky, Kenny Pickett, both of whom apparently have looked really good in camp. They look good in the preseason. So maybe maybe Mitch Trubisky can revive his career. Maybe Kenny Pickett can be the guy. There's a lot of questions for the Steelers. TJ Watt, obviously I mentioned him earlier. I think he's the best pass rusher in the NFL. He's going to test the Bengals' new offensive line. But in my opinion, the Bengals just have too much going for them to drop this opener at home. So I'm going to take the Bengals to win in week one. Let's move on to the next one, the Indianapolis Colts at the Houston Texans. This is my survivor pool pick of the week. 
I have the Indianapolis Colts winning this game. So if you're in a survivor pool, survival pool, I am in one. That's my pick this week. I took the Colts to win this one. I think it's one of the most sure games of week one. Why do I think that? Well, it's Davis Mills in a tryout year with nothing around him. And it's Matt Ryan on a new team. So there's some interesting quarterback drama here at play. Um, the Colts just have a good roster, though. They added Yannick Ngakwe and Stephon Gilmore to their defense. They have Jonathan Taylor at running back. They have a loaded roster from top to bottom, with the exception of quarterback, which Jonathan Ballard has never been able to solve. And then wide receiver, where they're honestly pretty thin after Michael Pittman Jr. To be honest, that's just nitpicking, though. The Texans are a bad football team with a new head coach. I expect the Colts to win a blowout in this one. I mean, Derek Stingley should be fun to watch in his debut against Michael Pittman. If you're watching this game and you're not a Colts or a Texans fan, that's probably why you're watching it. But I think I think the Colts probably win this one in a blowout. I have money on them, minus 6.5 in this game. Uh, it was minus 7.5, and, and I bought it down to minus 6.5 because I didn't want to you know, win by a touchdown and lose the bet. Let's roll on to the AFC East, another divisional matchup. The Patriots traveling to Miami to take on the Dolphins. Mike McDaniel makes his head coaching debut, and it's against Bill Belichick, who has eight Super Bowl rings and 321 victories as a head coach. So a little bit of a coaching disparity there. Uh, the Dolphins swept the Patriots last season, though. The Patriots' offense has been struggling for a while. Mac Jones is headed into his second year with a disgraced defensive coordinator in Matt Patricia, turned head coach, fired back in New England now, and another Bill Belichick disciple, disgraced special teams coach, turned head coach, fired from New York. And so they just come back home as New England assistants do. And somehow this defensive coordinator and special teams coach are sharing offensive play calling duties. And to be honest, I just don't get it. I don't understand how that's good for Mac Jones's development. I don't understand what the Patriots are doing here. It's almost like it's almost like Belichick is deciding to play like challenge runs of video games where it's like, you know, I can beat this game, but I want to try to make it harder. So I'm going to play with my control upside down or, you know, lefty flip on Guitar Hero or whatever it is. You know, it's almost like he's saying, let me try to win with just nothing. No coaches around me, no talents on the team. Everything on the field favors the Dolphins in this game. But Bill Belichick is the coaching X factor here. And I think he is petty enough, as evidenced by the fact he didn't name either of these guys offensive coordinators, because if he did, they would have to, they would stop getting paid by their former teams. So they're not offensive coordinators. They keep getting paid. He's petty. He's just petty enough to remember we got swept last year. And I think he's going to have a good plan for the Dolphins defense. And I think the Patriots, although I don't think it's going to be a great year for them, they're going to get out of week one with a win. So I will take the New England Patriots to beat the Miami Dolphins in week one. Let's roll on to the Baltimore Ravens against the New York Jets, where Lamar Jackson in Baltimore has pushed all the chips into the middle of the table, and he has bet on himself. Coming off of an injury, he has chosen to play out his fifth-year option rather than sign a subpar deal that the Ravens are offering him. And so he's betting on himself. To be honest, I can't wait for Lamar to get out of Baltimore and go to a team that believes in him and will build around him. I had Lamar rated very highly in his draft. I love him. I think he's a top five quarterback in the league. And I think it's disgraceful the way the Ravens have handled his rookie contract. that They've never given him a good offensive coordinator. They've never given him weapons to throw the ball to. I hope he does. I hope he sticks to his guns and he plays out and he ends up somewhere else. Fingers crossed it's Philadelphia. But uh, both of these teams, I think, had great drafts. The Jets should have. I mean, they had a ton of first round picks. They took Sauce Gardner, the cornerback, uh, Garrett Wilson, wide receiver, defensive end, Jermaine Johnson. And then they traded up for running back Brees Hall in the second round. So uh, those four rookies should be exciting to watch for the Jets. The Ravens, they also had a great draft. Tyler Linderbaum. Uh, Kyle Hamilton, both in the first round. Travis Jones fell to them in the third round. And, of course, they got David Ajabo, who won't be playing maybe at all this year, definitely not till later in the year. But they had a fantastic draft as well. For the Ravens, it's going to be a different look offense. Hollywood Brown is gone. They traded him for a first-round pick that they turned into Tyler Linderbaum. 
And I think it shows that <clears throat> they're moving from a vertical shot offense to more of an intermediate offense, which is good news for Jackson. He's a very good middle of field intermediate thrower. He's good at layering those throws in, and it's not something they have asked or allowed him to do very much so far. So I'm excited to see the new look Ravens offense. You look at the Jets, they've actually accumulated good weapons around Wilson. Brees Hall and Michael Carter at running back, Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, Garrett Wilson at wide receiver. They even have Tyler Conklin and CJ Uzoma at tight end. But right now, Zach Wilson's status is unknown for week one. The Ravens have some question marks too. Um, you know, they don't have very many weapons for Lamar, and both J.K. Dobbins and left tackle Ronnie Staley are currently listed as questionable to play. So there's a lot of unknowns in this game. I'm taking the Ravens here. I stayed away from betting on this game, though, largely because I don't know about J.K. Dobbins and I don't know about um, I don't know about Zach Wilson. If Zach Wilson was playing, to be honest, I would I would hammer the Ravens in this game. But Joe Flacco probably gives the Jets a lot better chance to win at this point, and it looks like he might get to play. So I'll stay away on this one. Rolling on, we have the Jacksonville Jaguars at the Washington Commanders. Look at that. New year. I said Commanders the first time. I also bolded it in notes, so I would make sure. Sticky note right up there. But anyways, uh, Carson Wentz is facing off with the coach. He got fired two years ago and the team that eliminated him from the playoffs and got him traded a year ago. So lots of storylines, lots of demons to exercise for Carson Wentz here. Uh, the Jags have picked number one in each of the last two drafts. This is a team with a track record of being bad. And I don't agree uh, with how they handled the offseason. They, they hired Doug Peterson, which I thought was a great move, and I hated almost everything else they did. From the draft where they drafted Trevon Walker number one and then drafted Devin Lloyd. I didn't agree with either of those picks to trade or paying Christian Kirk, the amount of money that they traded him or foyer or Luacon or trading away some of the guys that they've got, but they got to have Evan Ingram too. There's no denying that this is a better team talent wise, even if it's not worth what they paid, it's a better team talent wise than it was a year ago. The commanders are a better team on paper, but I trust Doug Peterson and Trevor Lawrence more than I trust Carson Wentz. And so I'm taking the Jacksonville Jaguars to win this game. I laid money on the Jaguars plus three points in this one. Rolling on, we have the New York Giants at the Tennessee Titans. This opens up our afternoon slate on Sunday football. Titans had the one seed a year ago, and then they lost in the opening round of the playoffs despite sacking Joe Burrow nine times because they're just not a good offense. Derrick Henry came off of a Jones fracture for the playoff game, and he didn't look like himself. He had 20 carries for 62 year, or 62 yards. So I'm concerned about Derrick Henry. He's 28 years old. He's got a ton of touches, and he's so far defied the fall off that usually hits running backs. Is this going to finally be the year that he falls off? Now, I'm not going to predict that for the same reason I stopped predicting Tom Brady to fall off. They're, Tom Brady, Derrick Henry, they're just aliens, but it's worth monitoring Derrick Henry's situation as this year goes on. A.J. Brown is gone for Tennessee, traded to the Eagles for a first-round pick that they used to select Traylon Burks, who I had as my wide receiver one in the draft, but I acknowledged he was the highest variance receiver in the NFL. He could come out and be a superstar. He could come out and be a disaster because he's got a lot of refinement to add to his game and reports out of camp is that he has not looked good. And so that's not good for their passing offense on the other side of the hits on the other side of the field, the giants have a new coach, but generally the roster is kind of a mess. And even their GM mentioned like in a press conference earlier this week, he was saying it was just kind of the hand that we're dealt and we're going to make the best of it. So when your GM is saying that before the season even starts, it kind of gives you an idea of what to expect. It is Daniel Jones' last stand. He just doesn't have much to really work with. Kadarius Tony practices like once a month. Uh, Kenny Galladay's looked terrible. Sterling Shepard has just kind of been banged up and never become what people thought he might be. Uh, on the defensive side, Kevon Thibodeau's out of this one. He was injured on that cut block in the preseason, and so he's going to miss some time. Evan Neal will be interesting to watch, though, the, the Giants' new left tackle. <laughs> And so one of the things that I think is interesting to watch is, is Brian Daywell going to run Daniel Jones a lot? 
Daniel Jones is really athletic and Dable ran the ball with Josh Allen a lot down the stretch this last year. Now you wouldn't want to do that with Josh Allen from week one, but what do the giants have to lose? It's not like they're committed to Daniel Jones anyways. And so I think that they're going to run the ball a lot with Jones. Ultimately, I expect this to be kind of a slow, low scoring slop fest too. I think both offenses are going to struggle in this game, but I'll take the Titans. Uh, They're at home. They do have, you know, better infrastructure and Dable's a little unproven as a head coach. And so we'll see how that goes. Moving on, we have the Kansas City Chiefs at the Arizona Cardinals. The The Chiefs lost Tyree Kill this offseason, and call me crazy, but I kind of don't think it's a big deal. Like, their explosives were limited last year as teams stayed in two high shells, and so they got top value for Tyreek. I feel like they sold Tyreek at peak value as the market's starting to change, as teams are starting to play these more high shells to, to prevent explosives. They brought in Juju Smith-Schuster and Marquez Valdez-Scantling, guys who are good after the catch that can work underneath. I kind of like the moves. Like, those guys aren't as good as Tyreek Hill, but Tyreek Hill wasn't as explosive last year, and it's not because he's lost a step. It's just because teams are not allowing him to do that. I loved the additions of Trent McDuffie and George Karloftis in the draft. Those were both guys I had in my top 13 that the Chiefs got near the end of the first round. So they they are all in on building the defense, and they're going to let Mahomes and Reed figure out the offense. And to be honest, I like that decision. I trust Mahomes and Reed. It's the approach that the, the Packers have taken with Aaron Rodgers, except there's actually still talent on the offense for the Chiefs. They still have Travis Kelsey. They brought in Juju Smith-Schuster. They drafted Sky Moore. And so – you know, I, I feel like they're taking the approach the Chiefs are taking, but they're not taking it to that extreme. And I think they've found the middle ground. The Cardinals, on the other hand, I think they have the potential to be a complete train wreck of a dumpster fire this year. I mean, you go back to the offseason, you had Kyler's contract clause about the four hours of independent study, and then it was taken off because of all the backlash. You have Cliff Kingsbury's inability to win down the stretch dating back to his time at Texas Tech. You have them trading a first round pick for Marquise Brown, a guy who, you know, a deep threat. His his best trait is his speed, and yet he can't track deep balls or catch over his shoulder or in traffic. And and he's about to get paid. It's just a mess. DeAndre Hopkins is suspended too. Like, how long do we really think it's going to take for issues to arise if the Cardinals don't start fast? And I don't think they're going to start fast because I think they dropped this first game at home against the Chiefs. Moving on, we have the Las Vegas Raiders traveling to Los Angeles to take on the Chargers last week, last year's week 18 game between these two teams was electric. Justin Herbert led the Chargers back from a 15 point deficit in the final 428 of the game to get to overtime before ultimately falling short. If this game was not week one, I would expect a ton of fireworks. The firepower in this game is just insane, but I'm not too crazy about a 52-point over-under spread in Week 1 when we've seen sloppy starts from the lack of preseason action for starters last year. This is a huge game with a lot on the line for both teams in that pivotal AFC West race, a loaded division where every division game is going to be under the microscope. Both teams are trying to prove that they can be legitimate contenders in a loaded AFC West. And at the end of the day, I just trust Justin Herbert more than I trust Derek Carr. I think Derek Carr is going to have a great year. I think there's going to be some real fireworks in this division, but I'm going to get, I'm give me the chargers to take away the week one win. And in one of the, my favorite games that I'm looking forward to watching moving on, we have the green Bay Packers traveling to Minnesota to take on the Vikings another divisional game. The biggest question here is who is Aaron Rodgers throwing the football to? I mean, there aren't many weapons on offense for Rodgers to work with, but the defense is loaded. The Vikings have a new head coach in Kevin O'Connell. He should have a positive impact on Kirk Cousins and the offense since, you know, a head coach and a quarterback actually being on speaking terms is usually helpful. Something Kirk Cousins didn't have last year. I think the Vikings are going to have a better year than some people expect. And I think the Packers could struggle more than people expect. But in this week one opener, I'm going to take the Packers 
Yes, I know Aaron Rodgers laid an egg last year in week one. I don't think that repeats itself. He hasn't been on Jeopardy lately. I, I will take the Packers, and I put money on the Packers minus one uh, to win this game. Moving on to the Sunday night game, a rematch of last season's opener between Tampa Bay and Dallas. This one played at Jerry's World in Arlington. Uh, last year, this was just an electric Thursday night game. It saw Tom Brady engineer a come from behind drive with 124 left in the game. Just an outstanding game. In that game, Tom Brady and Dak Prescott combined to throw 108 passes for 770 yards and seven touchdowns. I don't think we're going to see that quite this year. Uh, for a few reasons, the Bucks' interior offensive line, it's featuring three new starters due to an injury a retirement and a free agency loss. Uh, Rob Gronkowski is gone. He was replaced with Kyle Rudolph. And Tom Brady's had this weird preseason thing going on where he was away from the team. Now, Brady's been doing it so long, none of that matters. It's not like he's going to show up rusty. But there is concerns about that interior offensive line. And for Dallas, the left tackle situation is worth monitoring. And really, their whole offensive line is pretty shaky. They've ignored depth. They've kind of allowed what was once an elite offensive line to just peter away. And then Tyron Smith goes down, and they had no backup plan. And so their rookie left guard is now playing left tackle. Or maybe he's not because they signed Jason Peters. I don't know what's going on with their offensive line, but it, that could be really problematic. And then, you know, their weapons have been downgraded too. Amari Cooper's gone for a fifth-round pick. Michael Gallup is coming off the injury. So – I anticipate this game lacking the pizzazz, if you will, of the week one matchup last year had. Uh, but I'm taking Tom Brady and the Buccaneers in this game. I think they will beat the Cowboys. And and to be honest, I'm not sure that this will be a particularly close Sunday night football game. I just feel like the Cowboys have lost too much. Uh, and now with that offensive line injury, they could start this season kind of in a hole. And then on to Monday night football. And what I honestly I think will be one of the worst games of the week. It's the Denver Broncos at Seattle. Uh, Russell Wilson's first game, not in a Seahawks uniform, will be at Lumen Field matching up against his former team. And I'd be interested to see how many Russell Wilson jerseys are going to be in the stands. You know, are the fans going to cheer him when he's announced or are they going to boo him? I, I'm not sure what to expect there. I'm not tapped into what Seattle fans really think, but the revenge storyline is there. But that's really about all the juice this game brings. As Seattle, just they look to be in for a long season. They're starting Geno Smith. Their offensive line is kind of a train wreck. Yeah, they've still got some receiving options, but this is kind of a team that's in rebuild mode. And to be honest, it's going to be better off for the Seahawks if they lose this game. And they lose a lot of other games to put themselves into contention for one of the top quarterbacks. Because the quarterback answer is definitely not on their roster. Denver wins this game pretty easily, in my opinion. Or, yeah, Denver wins this game pretty easily, and I laid money on Denver minus six and a half in this game. So there you have it. That is the week one show. Week one uh, preview show, that is. Uh, for my final thoughts, I just want to say football is finally back, and I couldn't be happier about it. It's been a long off season. And I'm ready to get back into the rhythm of covering every game for you guys. So I will be going live every Tuesday night somewhere around this time uh, with recap shows. So normally Tuesday night will be a recap show. I'll Next Tuesday night, I'll recap all the games from week one. So the games you missed, whatever, I'll tell you what happened. And then sometime during the day, either Thursday or Friday, I will be doing a preview show just like this one. I just moved this one up this week so I could make sure I covered the Thursday night football game and because I was so excited to talk football again. So I'll also be on Birds of the Roundtable every Tuesday night. So if you guys want to hear more Eagles talk, uh, specifically I'll be covering the Eagles in greater depth on Tuesday nights, hosting Birds of the Roundtable every Tuesday at 8 p.m. And assuming NFL Game Pass cooperates, which is a big assumption, I'll be putting out all 22 videos midweek in addition to the live clips that I tweet during the game. So uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this show. Uh, I hope you are uh, amped up for this season as I am. So thank you all for joining me for episode number 68 of Chalk Talk. If you enjoy what you heard on the show, and I know that you do, be sure you smash that subscribe button so you don't miss the next episode. Turn on notifications, drop a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. 
You can follow me on Twitter at half and half underscore TPL. You can follow the painted lines at the painted lines. And so for me and from the painted lines, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>